Good morning and welcome to each and every one that's here this morning. We're grateful for your presence and the opportunity that we have to study the subject I'm about to present to you. And um, if you haven't already marked your hymnals, please mark under number 269. That will be the song of encouragement. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful for your presence and invite you to open your Bibles and follow along what's going to be presented here. And if you should have any questions, feel free to ask, and we'll try to give you a Bible answer to your questions. And to understand that, and to better understand that as we go through this. The subject we're going to talk about this morning is infant baptism. Um, it is a highly emotional charged topic in the religious world, and has been for many years. And the people that practice this will defend this um, and yours going by, even then to the death. And it is one of those things that has migrated from um, where it started to where it is today. And we need to think about that. And infant baptism, how did we get to where we're at? Why are we where we're at in the religious world around us? And to understand all the things that are going on with infant baptism. Baptism. Certainly, there's many, many things that you could go through with this. But the biggest thing is that infant baptism uh, was first mentioned in the second century AD. And there was much discussion about that, and some started practicing this. And by the fourth century, it was kind of becoming commonplace in many religious realms and all the things that were going on and became an accepted practice. Some say that it is the parents dedicating their children to the Lord that they may bring them up in the church. This leads uh, their followers to believe that if this is not performed, that the child will be lost. And if you study this history on infant baptism in the centuries gone by, um, it got to the point to where those who opposed infant baptism were put to death because of that. They were persecuted greatly. Um, they were uh, banned from society at times. Their possessions were taken, and all other things that you can think of happened to these people that opposed infant baptism. Others believe if, believe if they are baptized as an infant that they do not need to be baptized as an adult. And again, it got to the point that someone, uh, uh, if someone was baptized as an adult, they were called being rebaptized, and it was condemned by those who believed in infant baptism. There's a lot of stretching of the scriptures to make infant baptism to fit into their belief of infant baptism. And that is where we're at today, where you have godparents and all the other things that have migrated over the centuries to where we're at today. And uh, we need to understand that and why it is there and why infant baptism ever got started to start with. And there's many other things that we could talk about, but for time's sake, I'm not going to get into all those this morning. I'll let you to see that infant baptism uh, was not there in the beginning. And it came along almost 200 years later, and all the discussions and fights that happened over infant baptism over the centuries to where we're at today. Let us see what the Bible has to say about this practice. Starting with, who should be baptized? In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
and teach them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And that's a New American Standard Version. So those who are in favor of infant baptism say, well, see, there is make disciples of all nations. So children have to be in there. And you have to be able to understand to become a Christian. You have to teach them, you have to baptize them, and you have to teach them again. Infants do not have the faculties uh, to become a disciple. You cannot teach them and then reteach them again. They were baptizing them for the remission of sins. Then teaching them to observe all that he commanded us again. And an infant cannot be taught to observe all his commands until they grow up. And we all know that. As emotionally charged as this subject is, and the people that defend it, understand what baptism is for. I want to touch on John's baptism for just a minute over in Matthew 3, 5 through 6. It says, Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Even if you go back to John's baptism or any baptism, the people had to confess their sins. They had to repent. They had to show that something was wrong in their lives. And we all know um, infants do not have the ability to confess anything other than their parents doing that for them. Parents, uh, infants were not born in sin and thus have no sins to be uh, dealing with. And many things has caused all this to come together over the centuries. And if you read up on that, this subject, you'll find that many other things, which I probably will not touch on this morning, that they have drug into this. Over in Mark 16, 16, he says, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. American Standard Version, again, New American Standard Version. As we can see from here, one has to believe. And to be able to believe, you have to be able to hear believe. You have to understand. You have to comprehend. You have to grasp a hold of that. And certainly, an infant does not have that ability to believe and then to be baptized. And then comes salvation. Again, infants have no sins to be saved from. If you go over to Acts 2.38, and this reading that Brother Dan had for us this morning, Acts 2.38, and it says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as we can see that there had to be a repentance, there had to be an action, there had to be the ability to do these things. And so we know that Infants have nothing to repent of, nor do they have the ability or the mental faculties to repent of something. And they have no sins for which to repent. And then to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Again, infants have no sins. So there would be no need for an infant to be baptized. If we go over to John 7, 29, it says, When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John again. These people were fleeing from things in their lives which were not right and looking for God. 
An infant certainly does not have that ability. And it says they acknowledged God's justice and were baptized in John's baptism. And by, we know that infants can acknowledge nothing in their lives. This is a man-made doctrine, teaching, if you would. And it has caused many people to think what they're doing is right. And it cannot be found in the scriptures. Acts 8 and 12, speaking of Philip and the eunuch, 8 and 12, it says, but when they, uh, when they believed Philip's preaching, and the good news about the kingdom, excuse me, that's back to about the Samaritans for that, um, of God, in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, men and women alike. There are no children mentioned there, and there's no need for children to be mentioned there, for they do not have um, sins to have to uh, acknowledge, to be baptized for, or anything else. Those that believe the good news, to hear, believe. Infants do not have the ability to believe anything. We teach them things as they grow into adulthood, and they become uh, where they're at or what we teach them. There are no mention of infants being baptized here or anywhere else in the scriptures. It is a far stretch when they try to bring the things in um, that they do to try to make infant baptism to be a thing that is a, should be and is accepted in a religious world. Infants have no sins to be washed away. And you get into even going back to the covenant of Abraham and circumcision and all the other things that they drag into this. And you can read for hours on this subject and uh, the original sin, all the other things that comes into this that they try to paste on this to make it uh, where they need it to be to be able to do that. Over in Acts 10, 46 through 48, talking about Cornelius. And Peter came to him. And 46, it says, For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Again, they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Infants do not have that ability. Then Peter answered in verse 47, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? Question, right? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In the American Standard Version again. No one can refuse water or is the ones that were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Infants do not have that ability. Infants do not have the ability to accept or refuse. And then they were baptized. And again, infants have no sin or need to be baptized. If we go over to Romans 6, 1 through 7, and touch on that for just a minute. Romans 6, 1 through 7. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, uh, into uh, Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we to uh, might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his res resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we may would no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. They were not to continue in sin. They had given up. They had given that up. They'd been baptized, and all the things were going on in their lives as adults. These people were, 
and they had been baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. Again, baptism is for the remission of sins, and infants have no sin. They're pure, they're innocent, and there's no one that's ever had a child to hold them in your hands when, when they're newborn, even to uh, older, that can say that they have sin. For we know they're as pure as the white snow in the winter. And we know that, but yet this has come about. And they were to walk in newness of life. Where would an infant have to walk in newness of life? They're just beginning. There's no newness of life that they have to try to follow. And our old self was to be crucified and left behind. And again, infants have no old self to leave behind because they are new. With that, when should a person be baptized? And the cause is all of the heartburn with this infant baptism. Over in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, it says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Please explain to me where a child has that ability. Everyone who wants to be a Christian must have the ability to confess him before men. Certainly, infants do not have this ability. Everyone who denies him will be denied. Again, infants do not have the ability to deny anything. Over in Romans 10, 9 through 13, it says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There is no distinction between the Jews and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We must confess him with our mouth. And again, you please show me the infant that has that ability. We must believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And again, infants do not have that ability. And we must call on the Lord to be saved. And again, infants are not able to call, to call on anything or anyone. So, considering these things, why should we be baptized? However, in Romans 3, 21 through 26, Romans 3, 21 through 26, it says, But now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been manifest, being witnessed by the law of the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Um, this was a demonstration in righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, 
And the righteous we know, the righteousness of God through faith is in Christ Jesus to those who believe. Infants do not have that ability, nor will they ever have that ability. All that are age of accountability, sin and fall short and need to be baptized for the remission of their sins. And we'll get to this a little bit later. But we are accountable for our sins and not someone else's. Infants are not sinners and do not sin. They do not have any ability to distinguish between right and wrong. Please show me an infant that has that ability. And the blood of Jesus Christ is shed for those of us who are sinners and are willing to accept the plan of salvation. An infant does not have that ability and never will. Romans, the sixth chapter in verses 20 through 23. It says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefits were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now I've been freed from sin and enslaved to God. You derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All of us have been of the age of accountability and know this, know that sometime in our life we sinned and were the servants of sin. When we willfully practice something that the scripture said not to do. Again, Infants do not have that ability. They cannot distinguish between right and wrong like we can. And God never expected them to. Thus to say that children need to be baptized is a real stretch of the imagination. For they have nothing to be baptized for. They have not sinned. They have not been enslaved in sin. They have nothing to be ashamed of. And we need to understand that. When we were sinners, we know when we look back, if we had died in that situation, what the wages we would have earned would have been spiritual death. No exceptions. But babies have no sin. Infants have no sin. They don't have anything to look back on, and they don't have anything to repent of. And when we understand that, we will fully grasp what God has given us to think about. Over in Colossians, the second chapter in verses 8 through 13, Colossians 8, uh, second chapter 8 through 13. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, an empty deception according to tradition of men, according to elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. Where does infant baptism fit in that first verse? For in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily in a bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is ahead over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, the heart, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, and have been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up from, up with him through the faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions 
and the uncircumcision of your heart, he made you alive together with him, having forgotten all us all our transgressions. So that you're not taken captive through that philosophy, empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world. Infant baptism, where does it fall? Infants do not have the faculties to do any of these things. And certainly the circumcision that's talking here is the circumcision of the heart. The infants have no sins to be removed. We are made alive when he forgave us our transgressions. And infants have no transgressions to deal with. Again, what is baptism for over in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For even as a body is one, and it has many members, and all the members of the body through uh, though they are many, but one body, also, so also in Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. This is a comparison to the physical body, the church is. And as our physical body has member members, so does the church. We that have met the requirements have been baptized into the body, the church. Infants have no need to be baptized until they're old enough to distinguish between right and wrong. Again, what is baptism for? Go over to Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, that fills all. Christ has been given a name above all other names, and God has put all things under his feet, and God has given him to be head over all things of the church, and we can see that the church is his body. We are members of his body when we hear, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized for the remission of our sins to become a member. Infants do not have that ability. And again, what are we baptized for over in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6? Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. All who is over all, through all, and in all. The one body is the church, which we are members of if we hear, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized for the remission of our sins. There is only one hope of our calling. I cannot be baptized for you. You cannot be baptized for me. I cannot be baptized for my children. They cannot be baptized for me. I can have the best intentions in the world in supporting infant baptism and what they think it's for when you read all of this. But it will do nothing other than getting your child wet. There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism for us all. A plan of salvation to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Again, infants have no need to be baptized until they have or reach the age of accountability and have done something wrong and then they know they've done it wrong 
and be able to repent of those sins which they have committed. Over in Galatians 3 and 27, it says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself, the King James Version says, put on um, uh, Christ, or clothe yourself with Christ. Those who have been baptized into Christ, if infants don't have that ability, no matter how much we want that to happen, they don't have that ability. No matter how strong our feelings are towards our children and wanting them to be in the right relationship with God, we can't do that. And we have been clothed or put on Christ once we have been baptized. Again, infants have no sin. And for them to be baptized for to wash away their sins, they have none. Over in Acts 22 and 16, it says, And now, why do you delay? Or why tarry, so the King James Version says, Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So we see that baptism washes away our sins. Again, infants have no sins to wash away. It is a ceremonial tradition that was developed by men over the centuries to where we're at today with all those things that are going on. Over in 1 Peter 3 and 21, over in 1 Peter 3 and 21, it says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism now saves those who are sinners and have met the requirements to become a Christian. To hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Again, infants have no sin and no need to be baptized. With that, where should a person be baptized? I'm going to touch on John for just a minute because of what he was doing. In John 3 and 23, John 3 and 23, it says, John also was baptized in Enon, near Shalom, because there was much water there, and the people were coming uh, and were being baptized. So we can see from this that it's not sprinkling or pouring that infant baptism theorists say some do submerge them but a lot of them are just sprinkling or pouring. As we can see from John's baptism before we get to the other, there had to be enough water for those persons being baptized to be fully immersed in water, a burial or buried in water for the remission of sins. Infants have no sin other than a tradition of men who has clouded this subject greatly. Acts 8, 36 through 39, as they were going along, talking about Philip and the eunuch, as they were going along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? After Philip has been talking to him about Jesus all the way out through there, and they come to water. In verse 37, and Peter said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him and went on his way rejoicing. <clears throat> And as we pointed out, the eunuch, after listening to Philip, knew that it took much water for them to both go down into and come up out of uh, uh, for this to happen, to wash away his sins. Again, they both went down into the water, and Philip baptized the eunuch. With all of this, infants still have no need to be baptized due to them um, not being sinners. There's no sin in an infant. And that's what clouds the water. To sum it all up, where does it mention in that an infant was baptized or should be baptized 
in the Bible. And as you will see, the stretch that they have goes from Lydia being baptized and her whole household being baptized with her, the jailer and his household being baptized, and Stephanus and Paul baptism of him and his household. And they said, well, there must have been infants in that house, so they had to be baptized. You can search the scriptures, but tell me why a child would ever need to be baptized. An infant. They are sinless. They are pure like the white snow of winter. Our religious neighbors want you to believe that infants are in need of baptism for whatever reason, twist they put on that, whether it's to dedicate their lives, to remove their sins, to put them in a right relationship with God, which is impossible, for they have no sin. And to put this in the best light that we can, to help out, God has made us free moral agents. Now, that's kind of a lot of stuff. Going. He gave us the ability to choose. You think not? Go back in the beginning to Adam and Eve. In the garden, thou may, may, you may eat of any tree of the garden except for the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Just right after that, Cain and Abel. Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain's was not. And God even tried to encourage Cain to rise above this. He said, if not, send life at the door. And we know that Cain killed Abel. Again, he had a choice, and he made that choice. In the days of Noah, the thought of man's heart was continually, over in Genesis chapter 6, were evil continually. What they thought about, what they did, it was a choice. And God chose Noah to build an ark to save him and his family from the flood because he was a righteous man. Again, he had a choice. Either build the ark or not build the ark. Get on the ark or not get on the ark. We all have choices, right? And on it goes. So as we think about this, infants have no need to be baptized. They don't have the faculties to be baptized. To confess that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, it is impossible. Well, our parents are doing that for us. Really? Please show me in the Bible where that happens. Our parents have the right to be a proxy for you to be baptized. It is not there. Now, scripture to kind of put this into perspective is Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, and night verses 19 and 20. Ezekiel 18, 19 through 20. It says, Yet you say, Why should the son bear the punishment of the father's iniquity? When a son has practiced justice and righteousness and observed all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment of the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment of the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. So we have to think about that. I am not going to bear your sins. Is what this is saying. You're not going to bear mine. But if we have a little child here that has no sin, where is infant baptism? What is it for? And why do we need it? And another couple of verses just passed on Ezekiel 18, 21 through 23. Puts all this in perspective and how God sees things, right? But the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practice justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and my practices and uh, justice and righteousness, he shall live. He shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not uh, will not remembered against him because of his righteousness which he has practiced. He will live. Have any, uh, I, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, 
rather than that he should turn from his ways and live. That is our God. Good things that God wants us to turn uh, from our sins, to observe his statutes, practice justice and righteousness. And those who make this change shall live. Infants have no need to be baptized until they reach the account age of accountability and can distinguish between right and wrong. It is not there. It is not in the Bible. And all the things that's come along with it through the centuries. Think about those things which we have talked about this morning. And you can even search this even deeper than I have touched on this morning. But infants are sinless. They're pure. We stand alone on our own sins that we have committed. And those things which we have transgressed God's laws. And as God is a just God, and he has spelled that out for us. And if we repent and turn from the wickedness that we have got into, he will forgive us. So if you're with us this morning and you have not been baptized into Christ for remission of sins, listen. If your parents baptized you when an infant, that's not going to get you to heaven. You have to make that decision consciously yourself that you are a sinner and you need to repent of your sins and you need to stand on your own two feet and to understand that to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized and then live faithful unto the end is a process that God has put in place and not all the other things that traditions of men have clouded this and other subjects that we know of. So if you're with us and you have not done that, we are afford you the opportunity to do that this morning. Or if you're with us and you have fallen into the world and the sin and the things that are causing you so much trouble that you'd like to get rid of them, come forward and we will pray for you that God will forgive you. And you can pray for us because we all need it. If you're here and you need either one, please come. Again, we stand and sing number 269.